This was about eight years ago where I believed I received a word from the Lord. Uh, it's hard to describe the word. I'm going to summarize it. I felt like the Holy Spirit showed me that a major emphasis for the church in the coming days would be the issue of freedom. Now, I'm not saying that we haven't focused on that in, uh, in all that we've done and said as we teach the Bible, but it was as though the Spirit of God put an emphasis on this area. And, and here's, here's why, as I begin to ask the questions and journal and seek the Lord over this. With the increase of knowledge and modern advancement and technology, the generation that we're a part of is exposed to so many options. It's like beyond measure today. So many choices, so many options, so much conflicting with our soul. And in my estimation, this has resulted in us being more bound as a people. And I'm talking about Christians as well. It seems to me that we've learned to accommodate the things of our flesh. And cultural Christianity sets in, even if it's not something that we want. And friends, I could talk to you about the staggering statistics. That, that would certainly bring up what we're talking about today. But I think we all realize that today it's bad. It's bad what we're up against, what we're fighting with, what we're negotiating in the world that we live in. I was reading some statistics. There's a, there's a buzzer that somebody needs to turn off. Uh, whatever's in your oven, it's done. Okay, turkey's done. Amen. Um, I was surprised to learn. Amen. I was surprised to learn. <laughs> I was like, I might not be done though. Um, I was surprised to learn about some statistics after the pandemic, things that are true as a result of that. And, and this is just like addiction stuff. So talking about like drug abuse has increased in the last few years by 16%, alcohol abuse, 23%, and porn use as high as 25% just since the pandemic. And this is just addictive stuff, but we're living in a culture of excess and it's not abundance. Just because we have more doesn't mean that we are more. In fact, what it does mean in my estimation is that we're probably more bound as a result of it, giving our affection and our attention to so many more things. And we have to realize that, that many are bound in addiction and past wounds and pain and crippling fear and anxiety and worldly pleasure and entertainment. It's like without measure at, at our fingertips, we give ourselves to so much. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about modern day idolatry and it's enslaved our hearts and our minds to do and be what, other than what God intends for us. And this is what we want. Everyone in this room, what, what we want is to be all that God wants us to be. We wanna do all that God has called us to do. We wanna put our hand to it. We wanna please him. We wanna serve him. But we have to realize that there's so much clamoring for us to be bound the enemy has been at work and is certainly at work in our culture and in our time. And even when we talk about freedom, I was just simply thinking about the subject of freedom and how it's framed today in a worldly sense rather than a biblical one. For example, in the Western world and, and in the United States, worldly freedom means to cast off all constraints so that we can do what we want, say what we want, buy what we want, go where we want and live how we want. That's what freedom means to so many of us. It's to throw off tyranny so that we can have and be and do anything that we want. It's usually about me. Worldly freedom is to do what we want, but biblical freedom is to do what God wants. It's entirely different. So something kind of feels uncomfortable when we're clamoring just for our own personal freedom and liberty. Now, to a degree, we need personal freedom and liberty. I'm not saying I'm against that, but it's so that we can love and serve God and others. That's the point. Biblical freedom is where Jesus sets us free from the shackles of sin so that we can do the most important thing, love God, love people, and serve well and give our life away spend our whole life on what matters to him and not to us. And it's God's desire to set us totally free from all bondage that would bind us from this very purpose that God created us for. And in Luke 4, Jesus here gives the mission statement of his intention. He declares his intent to all that have ears to hear. And I wanna give you some context before I read verse 14. Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and it says the Holy Spirit comes upon him in power. Then he's led into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by the devil himself. And during that time, Jesus did not compromise one time. 
He was hungry, he was alone, but he did not sin in any way. Jesus was absolutely sinless. The Holy Spirit led him to where, to, not to just be tempted in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit led him to a place where he would overcome, but he did it on our behalf. He was baptized for humanity. He overcame the devil because we failed, but he took back the keys. Jesus did all of these things so that he would purchase back the freedom that you and I could have. And after he did that, he comes up out of the wilderness and here's what the Bible says when he walks into the synagogue in Galilee. Verse 14, Luke 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and the news about him spread through all the surrounding district and he began teaching in their synagogue and he was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he was, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. Now he's gonna quote Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, now catch this, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and all were speaking well of him. I bet they were. I bet they were. This is the word of the Lord. As we know, and I've said this, Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 61. And in Isaiah 61, you have to know this, Isaiah actually gives a prophetic word that had natural implications for the nation of Israel at that time. They were under siege by the Assyrian Empire. And so the prophecy in their day meant that the physical captivity that they were subject to would soon be over. And God fulfilled that. In 681 BC, they were set free. God brought them into a glorious freedom. And so just as the prophecy was given, it manifested and came true. And so here we have Jesus. This is like 700 years later, this prophecy has already been fulfilled. He plucks it out of Isaiah 61 and he reads it and he looks at everybody in the synagogue and says, and today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you were a good Jewish student, you'd be, what? <laughs> and, it's, and it's something that's very important when you read the Bible, a prophecy can have dual meaning. It can have natural implication, which it often does, but it also can have spiritual implication, which clearly that's what is happening here. Jesus used this passage to preach absolute freedom to a world that was held captive and in bondage to sin. And that's what he was going after and why he brought this up. And this is what I wanna to say to you before I bring up any other points. The heart of Jesus is that you and I would be so free that we would be so free, that he, that he looks into our eyes like he did them on that day. And he says to you, I want to make you free. I mean, when you look into the heart, into the eyes of Jesus, what does he think about you? What does he think about your sin? What does he think about your secrets? What's it, what does he think about your discrepancies? What does he think about your past? He looks at us and he says, I want you to be free. I came for this to undo and destroy the works of the devil. And Jesus has the power to do it. No one else can say this. No one else can do this, but Jesus certainly can. He wants us to be free. I, I could have named this sermon, Jesus wants you to be free. In fact, I should have. Just, just go ahead and write that down. That might be a new title. I think I just retitled the sermon. Catherine, can we change the notes for the next service? I don't think we can. I want to look at a couple things about freedom today. The first is this. We, we must receive our freedom in Christ. Everybody say receive. receive. So spiritually speaking, freedom is not something we achieve. It's something that we receive. You can't work for it. You can't make it happen. You have to receive it through Jesus Christ. And receive means this. It means that we take into our possession something that has been offered to us. So in verse 18, Jesus, he gives his mission statement before he goes out to minister. He literally goes out to do all the things that he says. But here's what he says and whom he says it to. He said, I've come to preach the gospel to the poor. The poor are those who are in need spiritually and physically, right? He's, he's bringing up a prophecy that has both implications. The second thing is he said, I've come to proclaim release to the captives, those who are bound and helpless. The word captive literally means prisoner of war. 
I've come to bring recovery of sight to the blind, those who are physically ill, the outcast, the sick, the wounded. I've come to make them well. And number four, he said, I've come to set free those who are oppressed. Those are, those are the people that have been broken and bruised and crushed by any type of adversity. And friend, that is you and that is me. And sometimes when we think about freedom and we read the words of Jesus, we tend to think, well, that can't be me because I'm not going through what others are going through. That, that's gotta be people that have really experienced a lot of pain, adversity, oppression, and persecution. But I challenge that and push back on your thinking if you have that thinking and say, Jesus intends everything that we face. He wants us to experience such an utter freedom that we can't do anything but praise and glorify him because it's his work in us. It's what we receive. So when Jesus mentions all four of these things, he's talking about groups of people that live in a type of captivity. They're prisoners of war. We're in a spiritual battle and we are prisoners of war. We've given ourselves over to sin. Adam and Eve did that and every person ever since. We are bound and we are captive to this thing called sin. And Jesus declares over us, I have come to preach the gospel, proclaim, release, recovery of sight. I've come to set you free. I don't know, you ought to smile today. That's a wonderful word from Jesus Christ to your heart. I want you to be free. Not kind of free, not a little free, not somewhat free, but I want you to be totally free from the inside out. But here's the problem. Some people do not know how bound they are, nor can they confess it is so. We just can't get very honest at times and we stay bound Jesus is negotiating with some of the Jewish leaders of his day in John chapter eight, and he confronts them. These are people that knew the scripture, but they did not know their need for freedom. And here's what he says to them after this sort of conversation. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. He basically just gets down to brass tacks. He's like, guys, <laughs> you're thinking you're okay, that you're children of Abraham that you're religiously minded, that you've studied and memorized the Torah and that you grew up knowing all this stuff and you think that you're fine, but I'm telling you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. You're enslaved by this and you can't free yourself. It's not a matter of knowledge. It's not a matter of pedigree. It's not who you know. It's not where you go. It's who sets you free from the inside. Jesus alone can do that. Jesus is declaring this to these, to these people and they're not listening. And the reason is because they don't know their need. They don't know their need. Matthew chapter five, blessed are those who are the poor in spirit. Everybody knows this, right? The Good Speed translation says, blessed are those who know their need. Blessed are those who know their need. Do you know your need? They, knew, they had to know their need. They didn't know their need. I was thinking about, ironically, I was thinking about the zoo. Now, for the sake of my illustration, I may ruin your zoo experience. <laughs> but you love it. You just close your kids' ears. Most of them are in children's ministry. Anyways, <laughs> they're going to say, how was the sermon today? That was fine. <laughs> We're going to the zoo. <laughs> but when you go to the zoo, fu funny experience. I mean, we, we've gone to the zoo, zoo for years um, and, and, and experienced that disappointment that you do when you go to the zoo. I, I'm the guy that goes up to like the tiger and the lion, you know, cage. You know, you can only stand so close. And, and I'm like, come on, <laughs> you know, like, come on, like, give us a roar, man. Come on, Aslan, rise up, do, do something. You know, you, you, <laughs> you want to see this lion and this tiger, like, just be fierce. You want to, like, almost fear. Like, like, just, <laughs> and they're just like, land. <laughs> you know, that? <laughs> they're just like half dead, you know, and, um, and because they eat protein and they sleep 80% of the time, which is another thing you learn, particularly if you have homeschool kids. <laughs> which we do. It's not a diss, it's the truth. Just learn a lot of things. Everything's an educational experience. <laughs> the homeschoolers are like, yeah, so true. Here's what happens. When we take animals out of their natural environment and we put them into captivity, they change. And you say, Ben, that's kind of that's harsh, and, and I don't want to think that. Well, let me go ahead and read to you a national study and what they have to say about it. Animals suffer, quote, 
permanent frustration because they have no freedom of choice and cannot behave as they would in their natural environment. This almost always leads to genetic, physical, and behavioral degeneration. In other words, captivity changes the way animals think, act, and live. They are no longer what they were born to be. So whatever it is that we're looking at in these exotic animals and we're having a fun time, I know this is terrible, sorry, but whatever we're looking at, this is not what they were born to be because we are now controlling their environment for our entertainment. And I wanna tell you something, that is similar to what happens to us when we're subject to sin. God created us. In his design to be sons and daughters, we gave ourselves over to sin. And that's a type of captivity. And it changes the way that we think. It changes the way that we live. And God wants to set us free from that so we can come back into what he created us for. This is what Jesus is saying. Like, this is paramount. This is epic. This is amazing. He's saying, I've come to set the captives free. And the only people that won't be free are the ones that can't recognize that they need it. Those are the only ones they stay bound because they don't see how much they need what Jesus alone is offering. Jesus said, I, I've come to set the captives free. In evangelism training, I, I like to walk through this and I want to share it with you. It's four points. This is the story of humanity summarized very simply. Number one is creation. We were created in God's image to know, love, and follow him in loving relationship. Number two is rebellion. Humans chose sin and self rather than God, which brought bondage to sin and all of the spider web of effects that have plagued us ever since. But number three, Jesus came to live, die, rise, to purchase back those who would place their faith in him. This is redemption. He paid the price to bring us all the way back, not part of the way back, but all the way back. And here's the fourth part is restoration. Those who are in Christ are daily being restored to all that God has intended for us from the beginning. If you can memorize anything from this sermon, it would be these four points. This is how I share the story of the gospel with people. And I remember it, creation, rebellion, redemption, restoration. That will help you out there when you're talking to folks about the story of the gospel. And we have to understand that the only way that we can truly get free is first, we have to give our lives to Jesus Christ. I, I was talking to a young man last night and he was negotiating. He asked for prayer. And before I prayed for him, I asked him if he knew Jesus, have you given your life to Jesus? His response was, I believe in God. I said, that's wonderful. Have you given your life to Jesus? And here's how I explained it to him. I said, from the inside your heart. I'm not asking if you're perfect. I'm not asking you if you live every day the way that you ought to. We all have issues. We all have things that we need God to help us with. We all are in the sanctification process. I didn't use the word sanctification. You should be proud of me. But I told him, I said, from the inside, you want to follow God. You want, it has to be your heart. That's, that's indicative of a new heart. You have to want this other way. Otherwise you're playing a religious game. If it's not your heart, I want to follow God. You wake up in the morning, you might struggle, you might stumble, but I want God. I love God. I want to follow him. That's my choice. That's my heart. If that's not there, we're not free. That has to come first. That's the first thing. That's salvation. And the Bible says he gives us a new heart. He takes out the old stony heart and he puts in a new heart of flesh. And that heart feels, that heart, I want God cries out, Abba, Father, he's my dad, and I'm a son or I'm a daughter. That's, that's the reality of the gospel. And I talked to him about that, and, and he wanted prayer for relief. He wanted his life to be a little bit better. And I, and, and I said, hey, I love you. I'm not going to pressure you or push you. But the more I talked about what Christianity really is, it's giving your life to Jesus because he's worthy of it. And he gives you a new heart, and it's worth it. Man, it's worth it. You know, I just, I, I beg people, it's worth it this wall that's holding you back. None of this stuff is worth it. This is worth it, hear me. And he didn't get there, but he's close, amen, he's close. But I don't push people over so I can put a check on the box. So another one came to Christ. I'm not interested in that. It's gotta be from your own heart. It's gotta be your choice. This isn't just raise your hand at the end of the service. That's why I ask people, if you really want Christ, raise your hand and acknowledge that he's doing something in your heart and then come forward and pray with us. And let's get right with God. And that's a glorious moment. It's a glorious moment that happened for me 24 years ago, some of you even longer. 
And so we praise God. If you want to be free, you have to receive that freedom in Christ first. But number two, we must retain our freedom in Christ. Retain means that we keep in our possession what was received through continued practice and use. So here's how it works. God makes us free in Christ spiritually as we're born again, but the outworking of our freedom on a practical level is realized as we walk with him in discipleship. Something that helps us better understand this is that we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body. And here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. He says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. In the passage, Paul says, may God sanctify you entirely, your spirit, your soul, and your body. And this is where systematic theology helps us immensely as we think through what actually transpires from the time we're born again to the time we actually meet Jesus. And I want to share with you three things. It's very important. Number one is justification. Now, when I got saved and I got into prison ministry, we'd go in and talk to the inmates and we would say justification as just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. You are justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Anybody heard this before? Well, you're blessed. The rest of you, you're welcome. Justification is about your spirit. This is what God does. When we give our lives to Jesus, he declares and he pronounces that we are right before God. We have right standing, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is justification. That means that our spirit is right with God. There is nothing wrong with our spirit if we're in Christ. You don't need more spiritual healing. Your spirit is born again. The spirit of God has breathed into you and we were dead, now we're alive. Our spirit will live forevermore. But that's not all there is. There's also sanctification. And this is about our soul. This is where God sets us apart through our life with our participation as we walk with him. See, this is the part that we partner with God on and this is actually where most people get confused. Because spiritually and positionally, I am right with God. He sees nothing wrong with me. But practically, you might be, and I'm talking about your neighbor, of course, you might be a hot mess. And so you read the scriptures and the scriptures say that you are free and you don't feel free. You don't look free. You don't act free. And your wife or your husband knows you're not free. And so you're trying to reconcile these two things. You're like, this is what the Bible says about me, that I'm seen through the blood of Jesus, that I'm made right in his eyes, that I'm justified, but now I'm being sanctified. And if that's true, then why don't I look different? And I'm struggling and I'm wrestling with that. And here's why. It's because through our participation and in our obedience, as we walk with God in this life, he constantly sets us apart and he changes our soul where our spirit dominates our soul and we live the way that God's called us to live. So he must see some value in that. You say, well, why didn't God just take me up to heaven when I said yes to Jesus? Because there's value in the transformation process. There's value in you and I not taking from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, looking at the tree and saying no. There's value in us worshiping God in the face of options. There's value from the Lord where he gets worship from our life by laying ourselves down when we could do something else. And here's the deal. You may say, well, we've always failed, but now that we have the spirit of God living in us, you can. Everybody say, I can. Before we were a Christian, we read this book and the best that we could do is religion. Sophisticated, sure, but the best that we could do is religion. Our obedience was not from the heart. But now that we're saved, we're justified. Now we can be sanctified because when the Bible calls us to obey by the spirit and the power and the presence of God, we actually can. So nobody has an excuse. It doesn't matter what we've gone through. I'm not saying it. I'm not minimizing your pain or your problems or your difficulties. I'm just saying you've got the spirit of God in you the spirit of the living God. We've got the instructions. We've got the power of his spirit. We can live free. And he walks with us and works with us throughout our life to make that reality. That's sanctification. But then there's glorification. This is our body. I'm excited about this one. Upon death, God resurrects believers with a glorified 
spirit-filled titanium bodies. Whatever I get, I'm getting it. Where we can live in his glory and a new state in his presence forever. Justification, sanctification, glorification. But here's the part. If we're going to retain the freedom that's been given to us through justification, we're going to have to participate with him in our sanctification where we're warring in our soul for the freedom that we have in him. But we must obey. Here's the deal, guys. We must obey. Yes, you can, it's not about works for salvation, but I'll tell you what, now that you are saved, now that you're a Christian, it's about, it's about obedience. And we're either gonna do what Jesus says or, or we're not. And it's funny how a lot of theology is like, it's not about me, it's nothing that I do. Now that you have the spirit of God, now that you can read the word of God and know what it means, it actually has a lot to do with you. Your freedom, your sanctification has a lot to do with your choice when you wake up in the morning. And if I could put it simply, Freedom in Christ is this. It's where we've been restored back to our God-given choice again. We've been restored back to our choice and we look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we make a decision. I'm either going to pick from that tree or I'm gonna choose the tree of life. Now we can choose. Whereas before we couldn't choose, we just chose death. That's, that's, what, the Bible, that's what the Bible would teach. But here's what Paul said to the Philippian church in Philippians 2.12. He said, my, my beloved, just as you have also obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. Here's what he's saying. We work out what God has worked in. He gives us power, provision, instruction, and we obey. God's put it inside of us. We work it out with him as we walk with him. If we don't work out what he has worked in, then our soul will remain incarcerated in this life and we will literally just have to sophisticate to some form of religion. Hide what we really are and that's what so many Christians do and you don't have to. Come on, man, you don't have to. You can be free. Those words in the Bible are true, but we got to follow what it says. If you don't practice what the book says, you won't live in what the book promises. Well, there's a couple points. I don't have time for them, but I'm just going to throw them at you because we're going to unpack them in the weeks to come. Number one is we got to pursue holiness in our sanctification. It says in Hebrews 12, without which no one will see the Lord. That, that word pursue is very important. We have to pursue it. Just like we pursue all other things in life. We pursue being sanctified and set apart in the Lord. Number two is we walk by the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We walk by the power of the spirit, not by the power of the flesh. This is not about being self-sufficient. It's about being God-dependent. And number three, renew your mind. This is how we become transformed. We come pre-programmed and he's reprogramming us in Christ through the word and by the spirit and in fellowship with one another. Every Christian initially receives freedom, but we get discouraged as we war over our soul. And here's what happens. So many give up in that process. And here's what you could say to me today. You may not say it out loud. Please don't. You may say, I'm not totally free, Ben. You don't know, I've been struggling with some stuff for a long time, and here's what I wanna tell you, you can be. You can be. I'm, I'm gonna say it again, you can be. If anybody ever sits with me in my office and talks about one of the problems that they're suffering with and struggling with, I don't minimize their problems, and here's the thing, I don't understand everything. Even counselors, they don't understand everything. Their job is to help negotiate and navigate a way through. But not everybody's gonna to relate to your problem, not everybody's gonna understand your problem. But God does. And he's the one that's got an answer. So our goal is not to act like we know everything. It's to help each other experience the freedom that Jesus paid for. That's, that's what we do for each other. It's not about who's better and, oh man, I found the secret. We've all got the secret. You know how I feel about those books. You know, hey amen. I, I, I'm restraining myself. Jesus is calling us to be free. You're going to face temptations and thoughts and wounds and pain. How many of you got, have had some pain in your life? You've had some wounds in your life. You didn't, you didn't want them. You didn't ask for them, but they came, didn't they? Some unreconciled relationships. Some things have, man, Pastor Ben, I used to be really excited about God. You get up there and you're like, ah, and I used to be like that. But man, some stuff in life hit me and now, I, now I'm not feeling that anymore. I'm not like that. And, and, and I would tell you, you can be free. 
I'm not saying we act like those things didn't happen. No, we look at those things in the face with Jesus. And he sets our heart free, our soul free, so that we're not burdened and bound by those things. We acknowledge them, we pray over them, we walk through them, we feel them, we work through them. But Jesus, by his grace, can lift off the burden, friend. He can lift off the burden. Maybe you went through a divorce or you lost a child. That's horrific. I'm sorry, I'm, that's horrific. But Jesus can still make you free. Either he can or he can't. And I believe he can. I believe that's the savior that we serve. He's a redeemer. He's a perfect redeemer. He can make all things new. But I wanna tell you, he's passionate about it. <laughs> you think I'm passionate about it this morning? I don't even touch what Jesus feels. He is so passionate about us being free without constraint, without spiritual bondage, without sin in our life. He is so passionate about it. He will not leave you alone. It's like, he's just coming at you. He's gonna get a little closer. We're gonna try to avoid it and he's gonna keep coming after you're like, what is that annoying thing, that irritating thing? You can change churches, you can change jobs, you can change friends, and here he is right here. And you wake up and you're like, I, but I still feel that thing. He's still here, passionately pursuing our freedom, even when we're not, prodding us, convicting us, speaking to us. There's more, there's more. I've got more for you. Don't settle. This isn't it. This isn't all there is. There's more. Don't give yourself to that. I've got more and I want you to see it. That's what he's like. I was thinking about a friend of mine um, years ago when water restoration businesses were cropping up all over the place. My friend started a water restoration company. Some of you have had a water leak and you, you've, deal, you've dealt with that. You're probably sighing and sneering right now. I've been through it a couple times. But back in the day, and he bought one of those um, thermal imaging cameras. You remember when they cost like 20 grand and now you can buy like a small one on Amazon for... Well, I don't actually know what they cost now, but they're a lot cheaper. And he had one of those. It was like he'd bring it out for party tricks and, you know, put it up to somebody's leg and say, oh, what's in there, you know? <laughs> so he had one of those thermal imaging cameras and I bought this place. I was flipping houses at the time and the place looked brand new. It looked brand new. Everybody say looked. <laughs> it looked brand new. New carpet, new paint, new trim. It was clean. Everything looked new. But I noticed when I bought the place, there were all these air fresheners in there. And, and as a real estate, <laughs> stop triggering me, stop it, <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm triggered. Um, if that offended you, just come back next week. It'll probably happen again. <laughs> all right, so I took all the air fresheners out and then here's what happened. The smell was not just new carpet. It was not just new paint. Now it was like cigarettes, nic you know, nicotine and something funky and new paint and carpet. So now it was just like, like you know, 33% of everything. And I'm like, oh, there's a problem. So I was like, you know what? We're just gonna kills the whole place. So we baptized the whole place in kills. And then we repainted it. It already was brand new. Everything looked brand new. Now it smells like kills, nicotine, funky smell <laughs> and new carpet. <laughs> How's it happen? So I called a friend and I had him come over and take that thermal imaging camera to the walls. And every time he saw like one of these blobs, which I couldn't, it kind of, it couldn't read what was going on there, but he would just put a piece of tape and then we started opening up the walls and it was as bad as you can imagine. I mean, there was one like four by four, four by six section that was, we took it out. It was just black mold and I'm not wearing a hazmat suit or gloves probably for that matter, <laughs> but I'm okay today but I'm all right. <laughs> I've recovered people, I think. Um, it was bad. So what I, we did is we took out, we had to take out all the drywall, everything, bag it all up. It was, it was, hor it was nasty. Um, and here's the thing. It, it, it was everywhere he put that thermal imaging camera, there was something that you couldn't see behind the walls. And I thought, man, that's fascinating. And, and that kind of reminded me in, in a strange way about how Jesus sees behind our walls. We can say whatever we want to people, but Jesus is the ultimate x-ray and thermal imaging camera. You can hide it, but the fact is we're just not free. So why? So why? When we know Jesus has the vision of freedom for us, we are captivated by him and nothing else. That's what I want to be captivated by is Jesus and Jesus alone. That's my captivity. And the last part is this, and this is very important. We are called to release the freedom of Christ. In verse 19 
Here's the part that I didn't read. It says, Jesus said, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And if, if you haven't read Leviticus 25 in a while, you wouldn't know that this is in no doubt a reference to the year of Jubilee, which is further described there in the book of Leviticus. Now, the year of Jubilee is essentially this, big summary. Every 50 years, the people of Israel were to release slaves, indentured servants, debts, and ancestral property. They were basically just to restore all things. It was set apart as a year of release and rest in the land to bring about freedom and restoration and replenishing for people, for the nation, for crops, for animals. This is what God set it apart for. And Leviticus 26 says, if you don't practice the year of Jubilee, here's what's going to happen. And it's funny because in 1 Chronicles 20 something, somewhere in there, it tells us that Israel didn't practice it. And they actually suffered again captivity. Imagine that. You don't practice what the Bible says and you get the consequences that it tells you are going to come upon you. I've heard a lot of messages on the year of Jubilee, but what's amazing is when you keep reading through the Bible, you realize Israel never released the freedom that they received. Here's the facts, right? God was the source. He gave them a promised land. Everything that Israel had was from the hand of God. So all of these principles that he gave to them was about them acknowledging who he is and what he's done. And I want you to pass it on generation to generation. I want you to remember that I am the Lord your God. And whether that's tithing or giving or the year of Jubilee, all of these principles were about releasing what God had given because it didn't belong to them anyways. That's what he was saying to them. And Israel constantly did not practice this at all. The principle is if we don't take what God has given us or do what he told us, we will become bound again. And so many people stay bound even though they know the principles of scripture. They understand what it means to follow Jesus. But you can't just be forgiven, friend. Guess what? You've got to forgive. You can't just receive mercy. Guess what? You've got to be merciful. And if we receive something from God, but we're not willing to give it to other people, we are bound. They were and we are. This is why Jesus says, when you're persecuted, I want you to pray for and bless. I want you to take what you've been given and I want you to release it. That shows that you're free. Freedom is not just about what you get and walk in in and of yourself. It comes out of you because it's who you are. I'm not gonna just hold to myself what God's given to me. I've gotta give it away to other people. And to the degree that we are willing to become that river instead of a lake, we are free. We are so free. Someone offends you, forgive them. Someone persecutes you, you bless them. Is it fun? No, but as we do it, we find fulfillment, we find joy. And here's what we find. We find fellowship with Christ. Paul said, oh, that I might know the fellowship of your sufferings. And what he was talking about is that anything that someone does to me, as I look to you, I find a sweet fellowship with you in that place because I'm being like you. Oh, I could respond like the world. I could do in like kind. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But when I do the exact opposite and I move in your spirit, I find a fellowship with you in that place of suffering that I would never know because I'm releasing the freedom that I've received in Christ. Receiving freedom, retaining freedom, releasing freedom. It's this beautiful cycle of walking with Jesus where we're clean from the inside out. Listen, I love it. You want to encourage me? That's great. You want to encourage each other? That's wonderful. I love all that. We need all that. It's a wonderful, but I tell you what, that's a bonus to me. It's what I receive from him. And then it's giving away what he's given to me. See, if someone didn't give me joy, they can't take it from me. If someone didn't give me peace, they don't have the right to take it from me. God doesn't take it back. So I have to cultivate and steward what God has given to me. The freedom that we receive in Christ is freedom that he commissions us to release to others. And here's what it says in Psalm 84 and verse five. And some scholars say this is a Psalm that they would sing. It's really about their captivity and the glorious freedom that God has given to them. And this is the people of Israel. And they would sing this song, having gone through so much at this point, now on the other side of it, listen to what the psalmist wrote. And imagine the people of God singing it. Blessed is the person whose strength is in you, 
whose heart are the roads to Zion. This, this means they're going somewhere. This means they're moving out of where they were. It means the roads to Zion, passing through the valley of Baca, which means the valley of weeping, sorrow, pain. And they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with the blessing. They go from strength to strength. Now, you know that doesn't happen. You go from strength to weakness. But he's saying in this road, this is a road of deliverance. This is a road of freedom that every step that I take, I get stronger. I go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. It's their, their eyes are set on the heights of where God has taken them. And he's gloriously given them a freedom where they can keep going. And as they go, and they're on this road, which we now know in the new covenant is the narrow way. It's the path that we're on in following the Lord Jesus. We may have passed through the valley of weeping, but in that place, it says, I will make it a spring. You know what a spring is? A spring is a life-giving body of water that refreshes and replenishes others. It's released out of one place, but it gives life to others. That's freedom. Freedom is where we are a life-giving presence to other people. We may have gone through the valley of weeping, but God will make that place a life-giving spring in and through our life. Isn't that the freedom we want? Amen. Today, that's the freedom that's available in Jesus. We can and we will. As we go to receive communion, I think it's just important to, to do this after this message. Sometimes we do it after worship, but I thought, you know what? Does this not speak of freedom to you? The body and the blood of Christ, what he did for us. That's what we're receiving today. We're reminded of what Jesus has done. If you don't have the elements, they're at the either side of the stage today or, of course, right there at the sound booth. And if you're at home, you can have, take whatever you have. And I wanted to share this with you as we, as we move towards prayer and receiving together. Um, it might be a silly illustration, but it makes sense to me. I, we're in the spring season and a lot of us are trying to figure out our lawns and get that all ready. And, and we realize very quickly that it's not nice. <laughs> it's not nice. It looks more dead than alive. Come on. We put in a new lawn last year and uh, half of it started to grow. The other half of it, well, it didn't. And uh, all through the, uh, the winter, now into the spring, it's starting to grow and there are all these places that aren't growing and there are places that are. It's <laughs> It's just discouraging. I just go out there and it's like, why is there life in some places and death in others? And, and thank God for people that are really passionate about lawn care and, and teach me stuff. And they took one look at it and they said, the reason that your grass isn't growing is because you've got too much dead grass that you need to get out of your lawn. And so I went and bought one of these little machines and I dethatched the whole thing. And it was amazing, like just in a short amount of time, taking that which is dead out of something that is trying to live and everything else starts to flourish. Now, I just gave you guys some ideas on your way home today and you're welcome for that. <laughs> but stay with me in my illustration, please. I was reminded of how there are dead things that we need to rid ourselves of. And it's through the blood and the body of Jesus that we can. We have to stop picking up dead things and let God cleanse and purify our lives. As we come to communion, that's what we're saying. We're saying there's no forgiveness outside of Jesus. Whatever's dead in me, I just give it to him. I give him my sorrow. I give him my sickness. I give him my pain. I give him my sin. I give him all of that. And he takes it and he absorbs it. And what he gives back to me is life flourishing. Not because I deserve it. Not because you deserve it. Not because we can earn it but because God is good. And that's what the grace of Jesus is like. He takes our death and he brings us life. He gives you your life back. That's what the body and the blood of Jesus is about. He gave us our life back. He gave his back so that we might have life. He shed his blood so that we might be forgiven. That's communion, friends. Isn't that amazing today? So I want to pray with you before we receive. We'll read the scripture as well. But would you just bow your heads and pray with me for a moment? Consider your life. What, what is dead that you need to give to Jesus? Surrender to him. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come before you today and we recognize that there are things in our life that, that are dead. There are places that we need to be free and we're not going to try to make that happen. We're simply going to surrender to you today. So we come to, 
to your table. And we ask you, Father, to cleanse and purify our minds and our hearts. Forgive us for our actions, Lord, the sins that we have committed. We confess those to you, our shortcomings, those things that we've done. And we make no excuses in your presence for them, Lord. We just bring them to you. And now we just thank you that you went to the cross, that it's brought by your stripes we are healed. We've been made whole. A spirit, soul, and body. You paid for the entirety of our lives. You purchased us back. And we thank you for that today. So take our surrender, Lord, and breathe life upon each place of our heart and of our life that we would glorify you in Jesus' name. Paul said this to the church in Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. Thank you, Lord. Verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Father, we thank you today. We give ourselves to you fresh. From now until the day that you return, God, we pray that you would use our life, set us apart for you. May no evil thing reside in us and take up residence. We ask for more freedom in our life, Lord, no constraints, not by our own choosing. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would accompany us with your mighty power. Bondages in our life, break them, God. Barriers, Lord, between us and you and intimacy, Lord, break them down. We ask you to break them down today. Cycles of sin, religious guilt, baggage, bondage that's upon us, Lord. God, we pray today that you would break its power over us. I ask this to be a season of freedom in the name of Jesus. We ask for that for our family, for our children, our moms and our dads. We pray for freedom in the name of Jesus. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We declare that over every life because of your body and your blood. It's not what we achieve, it's what we receive. So we receive what you have today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Will you quickly stand to your feet as I dismiss you today? You said, well, Pastor Ben, I thought you were done. I am done. I am done. I am done. Except I was praying this morning. Um, for a while, and we're focusing on freedom. But here, here's some things that came to my heart. There's somebody here today, and all I can say is what I felt in my heart was that you're plagued with the pain of an unreconciled relationship. Now, a lot of us have that, but this is like painful to you right now. There's a sting that you're facing, and I, I just believe that the Lord is bringing hope into that place. And I pray that over you. I prophesy that over you today, that in that place where there's pain and you're plagued and it's heavy and it's crippling you, we pray hope over you in the name of Jesus. Somebody's facing a medical procedure, and I believe it's this week or next week. I, I can't tell. But there's an abnormal fear that's come upon you. And it, 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 you don't, it's not even rational to you. You just feel like it keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. And so we pray freedom over you today in Jesus' name, over your mind and over your heart, that God would settle you in his presence and he would give you the peace of Christ, which rules our understanding. There's another person that um, you feel like you're going through the motions and you're concerned that your heart has become indifferent. And I just want to say to you that God can raise you back up, not just to your former way, but he can give life to you today. Your passion for Jesus back, your love for the Lord back. God can give that to you today. And I want to pray that over all of us. Can we do that just one last time? Father, I pray where we're indifferent, 
where we might feel numb, where we're not sure what to do and we don't want to try again and, and work hard at it and we know we've done it before and nothing happened, I pray, God, for new life in that area. We want a better relationship with you. If you're here today and you, you need to know Jesus Christ as Lord, I'm asking after I dismiss that you come forward down here and we want to pray with you to give your life to Jesus. If you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, like we've said for years now, it's time to do business. Don't leave this room without doing business with God. Give your life back to Jesus. Have that restored. He can make it right. We'll be up here. Our pastors and prayer partners will be available for you. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said...